every automobile has a story. This automobile tells an epic story. Accomplishments like this allow us to be where we are today. This is the 1907 Thomas Flyer Model 35. This car matters because it won the legendary New York to Paris race in 1908. And it changed forever the image of the automobile. It's especially important to me because George Schuster, driver and winner of that race, was my great-grandfather. In 1908, the automobile was considered a novelty for the rich. They're cantankerous, they're capricious, they're, they're fragile, they're a real problem. But it's the future, and some people do see that. A proposed race was discussed, and the premise was really simple. Begin the race in New York City and head west, crossing the North American continent with the idea of using the frozen Bering Strait as an ice bridge over the Pacific, then the Asian continent, then the European continent, finally ending at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. No automobile had ever crossed the United States in the wintertime. Most everyone agreed none of the cars would get past Chicago. But you have to remember who the president was in 1908, a fellow by the name of Teddy Roosevelt. There was no way that he was going to have Europeans crossing the United States without having a U.S. representative in the field. This was a matter of national pride. The size, the gauge, and the power of the automobile is what enables it to make the trip. It's the only manufacturer that had the courage to put his name on the line. And that speaks volumes to E.R. Thomas. George Schuster was given 24 hours notice, pack your bag, be in New York City, you're gonna go around the world in an automobile. In Times Square, he found 250,000 people to view the start of this race. The other competitors were there, one German, three French, and one Italian team. The journey was as impossible as many had viewed. They started in a blinding snowstorm back in February, and they're ending right in the middle of summer in Europe. The conditions alone would have been more than most people can handle. George is the mechanic. He's the guy that knows more about the automobiles than anybody else. In 1908, this was like going to the moon. At one point during the race, they actually hitched teams of horses and dragged the Thomas through snowdrifts, measuring their progress in feet per hour. They finally reached San Francisco in 41 days, 8 hours and 15 minutes. When they reached Alaska, they encountered 10 feet of snow. So they redirected all of the teams to go by ship across the Pacific, then crossing Japan, finally entering Asia proper in Vladivostok. In the back seat of the Thomas Flyer was a New York Times correspondent. He had to file his story every day. Well, ships in those days didn't have telegraph. He would tie the story around the leg of a carrier pigeon who would fly back to Seattle. The telegrapher would key the story back to New York City and that would be front page news the next morning. By that time, they were down to three teams, the German Protos, the Italian Zust, and the Thomas Flyer. Danger was always a factor. The mud was so deep that horses would actually drown, and yet these three teams had to maneuver through those obstacles. This was an everyday, horrendous, beyond belief effort. This plank originally stretched the entire length of the automobile on both sides and they carried this in order to be able to ford streams to get over soft ground or snow. They would be able to throw these planks out ahead of the automobile and get traction and get back out of the holes. And a very famous moment during the race, the German team became stuck in the quagmire. The Thomas pulled around in front, tossing the Germans their rope to pull them out of their predicament. The German team captain opened a bottle of cognac and the two teams toasted each other in the vastness of Siberia. They continued on to Berlin, and finally, on the 30th of July, entered the city gates of Paris. A gendarme, a Parisian policeman, noticed the left front headlight. That had been broken by an unfortunate pigeon south of Moscow. Parisian regulations required that automobiles must have two functioning headlights. George turned to the policeman and he said, I have just come 169 days 22,000 miles, I can see the Eiffel Tower, and you're telling me that I can proceed no further? A Parisian bicyclist said, I have a lamp on my bicycle, you can put it on your autocar. George couldn't remove the lamp from the bicycle, so he hoisted the bicycle with the lamp on the hood of the Thomas Flyer. The Thomas Flyer crossed the finish line to win the New York to Paris race with a bicycle on its hood. The Flyer and its team were given a hero's welcome in New York. The mayor said to George, there's someone else who would like to meet you. So they hopped in the Thomas Flyer and went to meet the president. 
Teddy Roosevelt actually did sit behind the driver's wheel. He looked at George and he said, I like people who do things, not the good man who stays at home. After the conclusion of the race, the Thomas Flyer fell out of public view for many decades. It was not until 1963, a man by the name of William F. Harrow purchased what he thought was the Thomas, bringing it back to his museum in Sparks, Nevada. He immediately gets on the phone and he contacts Mr. Schuster and wants him to come out and verify the automobile. And in order to do that authentication, they had completely disassembled the automobile. George was very convinced that it was not the proper one. And there they noted three things. The initials MB carved into one of the seat frames by a carpenter when they added the fourth seat, a repaired clutch, which he had repaired just outside of Moscow, and a crack in the frame. In Siberia, running along the railroad tracks, the frame gave up on them at this point. They get a piece of iron from a local rail yard, they bolt it all back together, they continue on the race. All these little bits and pieces and marks and, and personal items that nobody knew was there but George convinced him that this had to be the car that he took around the world. The Thomas Flyer was actually laboriously restored to the smallest detail, but the finishing patina, the look, was the difficult part. You pick a moment in time to bring that artifact back to. Usually it's considered the moment when brand new. To Mr. Harris' credit, as a testament to what the machine and the men had accomplished, he picks the end of the race, that day when the automobile crossed under the Eiffel Tower. They took the car out into the desert outside of Reno and drove it in circles in the mud and the sagebrush to duplicate the wear and tear that should have happened over those months on the road. It tells that story of men and machines and adventure in a time when the world was changing. George passed in 1972 at the age of 99. The story you've just heard, I heard many times growing up through my teens and early 20s. Today I think it's as vivid a story and as compelling as it ever was. The Thomas Victory established the fledgling American automotive industry on a par with the European manufacturers. Equally important, it convinced millions of people, not only the versatility, but the reliability of the horseless carriage. This automobile transported men around the world when most of the world said it couldn't be done. In my opinion, it could be the most important artifact in our museum. The automobile itself changes the world, but what this automobile proved is this lifestyle that comes with this machine is here to stay. I'm Jeff Maul, great-grandson of George Schuster, and this car matters.